pleasant task to do today. My name is uh, Gilbert Cook. I am vice president of ANFA and a card-carrying member of that organization since day one. I am also everything imaginable emeritus at New School of Architecture and Design. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to read what I'm going to talk about today because I get very emotional about the subject. I'm talking about a man that was very, very important in my life and has been so to ANFA. So it is my task to introduce you to this man and his legacy via a memory of him. Okay, use the mic. Use the mic. Is that better? Sorry. Shall I start again? No. Uh, <laughs> So my pleasant task is to introduce you to a man and his legacy via my memory of him when he was alive and what his largesse has done for ANFA. Harold Hay was a visionary scientist, a great teacher, a pioneer in solar design, and frankly, one of the finest curmudgeons imaginable. I first met him one morning when I was director of architecture of the program at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. This very tall, white-haired, and at that time bearded stranger uh, walked into my office, all six foot six of him, and he sauntered in, having walked past a parade of administrative assistants that generally do not allow such things, introduced himself and sat down. I hate to admit this, but I took quick notice of the mismatched polyester plaid coat and jacket he introduced himself and proceeded to, and I proceeded to listen to his nonstop two-hour history of the past 40 years of mistakes made in science and technology in the United States. After I finally got in a word or two, he bid himself goodbye at visiting and saying he would be back the next day. That he did, arriving before noon and talked until past five. He asked if I would join him for dinner, then told me where to pick him up, and at that time guided me to his favorite restaurant, the hometown buffet. We, uh, he, talked until they closed, and after dropping him off, told me that he would stop by the next morning. I have to say he never said the same thing twice, and I was completely entranced with his brilliance, forward thinking, concern for the planet, and disdain for total focus on profit. He was, not surprising, awaited, wait, uh, waiting for me at my office when I arrived at 7.30. He actually started that day asking for my thoughts, plans, and interest in his comments. Around 11, he abruptly said it was time to catch the train, handed me an envelope, and said he looked forward to our next meeting. The envelope contained a check for a large amount of money, the first of many accounting for millions of dollars for research. Over the years, he'd become tired with a lack of true scientific research, thick papers read by few but their authors, and with very little to benefit humankind. He vacillated between highs and lows, finding solace with the inquisitive mind of students and anger with a total lack of results by many beneficiaries of his funding and with absolutely no use for politicians. He could, however, always make me laugh. I invited him to join my then 88-year-old five-foot-one mother and my son for Thanksgiving, and I will never forget, nor did she, when he stooped down, grasped her hand, and said, why, my dear, you're hardly out of diapers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've included a few excerpts written by Elizabeth Douglas of the Los Angeles Times, um, November 10th, 2007, titled, A Pioneer Refuses to Fade Away, His Passion for Solar Still Burns. And to quote, 40 years ago, Harold Hay came up with a way to heat and cool homes using just water and sun. At 98, he's still trying to get the world to notice. Harold Hay wants to help the world save itself, but he's running out of time. Forty years ago, he invented a simple, inexpensive way to heat and cool the home using the sun's rays and without the panels and wiring that come with conventional solar systems. He's been pushing for its adoptions ever since, trying to find footing in each of the solar industry's last three boom and bust cycles. Now 98, Hay is still making what he knows will be his final push. The retired chemist promotes his cause by funding research. 
He vents his frustration in letters, emails, phone messages to anyone who listen, and on his own website. He is sanctimonious, unyielding, and scathingly critical of other people's efforts and the solar business as a whole. He dis dismisses the energy department as being in the research forever stage and the solar trade is a bunch of money grubbers. Nice man. Hay has no interest in softening his message. He doesn't have time for subtlety. Quoting him, when scientists do science, when they play their game, they debate passionately and disagree openly, often with brutal honesty towards party lines, sacred cows, or, and he raises his voice for emphasis, other people's feelings. He closes the magazine. Now that defines me close, closer than anything you can get. That's why I'm a loner. That tenacity, has, tenacity has sometimes worked against him. He's a caricature of the mad inventor. He's a genius, but he's also impossible, and he is not allowed, he's not mellowed one iota. It's tempting to write him off as a bitter solar has-been, hoping for immortality at the end of his life, but given today's energy and climate challenges, ignoring its message and achievements could be a mistake. The main point is that he's trying to, now to make all our hopes pinned on all these complicated technology, and it's not that complicated. We could solve a lot of problems by building our buildings correctly. We became closer and closer over the next few years. One day he told me that he feared that there were some people trying to grab his estate and asked me to be his executor, something of which I knew nothing. I consult an attorney, a very rare attorney, completely honest, one that appreciated Harold's concern, and he unearthed a will that was, well, questionable. The lawyer drafted one for Harold's use with appropriate legal verbiage, allowing him to determine his estate. In that year, Harold spent a few weeks on several occasions at New School and delighted himself with the students who were in turn delighted by him. The home down buffet was still his choice for fine dining, but he's opened his mind to Tad in that regard. I asked him to be our New School commencement speaker held here at the Salk, and his words were full of hope and joy. He was, in a word, a hit. The following year, I saw his health decline, and I spent many, many weekends with him. The night before his 101st birthday, he completed his will and asked me to sign it as a witness. As executor, I could not, and he requested that I ask his neighbor to do so. The neighbor, a not quite as old gentleman, introduced himself to Harold. They had lived next door to each other for 42 years, and that was the first time they had met. <laughs> they talked for several hours, well into the evening. He signed a will for Harold, and he died in his sleep that night. He had many restrictive clauses, but with his generosity to his alma mater, the University of Wisconsin, the Smithsonian Institution, and others, he included ANFA, as he genuinely felt that a science-based union of architects and neuroscientists in understanding how the human brain relates to the built environment was meritorious. It is, and that's why we're here. So I thank Gordon Chong, past president to both ANFA and the American Institute of Architects for authoring the preliminary specifics of the Hay Fund, both honoring his delineated wishes and anticipating those with an ever-changing world. I honestly believe that Harold would have been most pleased. And I would like to reintroduce, reintroduce Tom Walbright to continue with the results of and the future plans for the Harold Hay Fund. Thank you. So with the generous endowment from Harold Hay, we were, we were put in the uh, very happy but difficult position of deciding how to use the money. And so we immediately rejected the idea of using it for operating expenses. This wasn't within Harold Hay's spirit or his vision. Uh, and we wanted to make it a grander gesture, something that would have a greater impact on the field, uh, the field specifically of the intersection between architecture and neuroscience. And so we settled on the idea of using these funds to support a research award program. 
basically to provide seed funding for research projects that fall at the intersection of architecture and neuroscience. And we announced a call for applications two years ago at this meeting. Uh, that was our first uh, Harold Hay Award call for applications. We received a number of applications, many of them, many, many of them quite, quite good. And um, there was a review committee put into place, a subcommittee of the board headed by John Zeisel. And that committee was composed both of neuroscientists and architects. And we very carefully assessed the extent to which each of these applications match a set of very well specified criteria for uh, this intersection of architecture and neuroscience. And we selected one application based on this and made an award. And I'll tell you about that award in a minute. We have the, the members of the award team here and they're gonna spend the next 45 minutes talking about the results of their research program. But what I wanna do first is announce that as of today, we're opening a call for applications for the next, for the second Harold Hay Research Award. Uh, the specifics of how to apply will be posted on our website within the coming days. Uh, what I can tell you once again is though that what we're looking for is something at that intersection. And so there are a few specific criteria that are important to us. The criteria will be spelled out in some detail on the, on the website, but I'll just mention a couple of things. First of all, uh, it is our requirement that the research team include both neuroscientists and architects. Um, I think that was the case in all the applications we got last time, but we just want to make sure that if you're going to apply, that you develop a program that is based on that kind of collaboration. Uh, secondly, we're open to broad areas of science at that intersection, uh, and this could include many of the topics that are discussed at this meeting, such as wayfinding, sensory processing, uh, the effects of environment on learning, and so forth. But um, again, the specifics of this will be, and how to actually apply, will be specified on the website. I apologize, we didn't get it quite into shape prior to this meeting because I've been preoccupied with a number of other things, putting the meeting together. But it will be posted very soon. And so I encourage all of you who are interested to, to apply for this. It's a very exciting opportunity. And you'll see that what came out of our first application in just a moment. And I'll introduce those gentlemen. There are three people that were part of that team. There is a neuroscientist, Sergey Gepstein, who is on the scientific staff here at the Salk Institute. There is an architect, Greg Lynn, who is, um, runs an architectural firm in Los Angeles and is on the faculty of UCLA. And there is a, a gentleman who is a production designer, a critically acclaimed production designer. His name is Alex McDowell. And the three of them put together an application which we, the review team, headed by John Zeisel, felt was outstanding. And we made an award, I believe it was uh, in March of 2013. And they've completed their project and they are here today to tell you about that. And so I turn it over now to the to that team, which is headed by Sergey Gepstein. 